Hey, it's Fran, again. And I wanted to do a very special video about one of my personal obsessions, the mighty Saturn V moon rocket, and in particular, the gargantuan F1 engines built by Rocketdyne Propulsion. Five of these brutal, elegant machines, the most powerful rocket engines ever built, lifted humanity to the moon. And here's what fascinates me. Every single one of them was, at its core, a controlled explosion. The physics wanted to tear the F-1 apart. The engineers forced it to behave. Now, if you've ever watched footage of a Saturn V launch, you've probably noticed something strange. Right at liftoff, there's this dark, almost black column of flame shooting out of the engines before it turns into that blinding white inferno. Most people assume it's just shadow. It's not. And by the end of this video, I'm going to explain exactly what that dark flame is and why it's the key to understanding one of the cleverest engineering tricks in the entire engine. But first, let's talk about how this beast actually worked. The F1 engine was powered by a combination of liquid oxygen, sometimes called LOX, and a highly refined form of kerosene called RP1. Think of it as jet fuel's more sophisticated cousin. These two propellants were mixed in the thrust chamber at a ratio of about two and a quarter parts liquid oxygen to every one part RP1. That ratio matters because it determines how efficiently the engine burns and whether it burns at all or simply detonates. And detonation was the enemy. Every component of the F1 was designed to prevent uncontrolled combustion. Because when you're pumping 2.5 metric tons of propellant into an engine every single second, the margin between rocket and bomb becomes terrifyingly thin. So how do you move that much fuel? You need a pump, but not just any pump. You need something that can move thousands of gallons per minute at pressures that would crush a submarine. Enter the turbo pump assembly. This is the beating heart of the F1, and it's a marvel of engineering economy. It combines a liquid oxygen pump, an RP1 fuel pump, and a turbine to drive them both all spinning on a single, massive shaft. But here's the elegant problem. How do you power a pump that's inside the rocket engine you're trying to start? You can't plug it into the wall. You can't use batteries, not for this kind of power. The answer is the gas generator. And this is where it gets clever. The gas generator is essentially a rocket engine inside the rocket engine. It's a small combustion chamber that burns the same LOX and RP1 as the main engine. But with a critical difference, instead of burning them efficiently, it burns them in an extremely fuel-rich mixture. Why? Because an efficient burn would melt the gas generator instantly. By flooding it with excess fuel, the combustion temperature drops to around 800 degrees Celsius, hot enough to produce enormous pressure, but cool enough to keep the chamber from destroying itself. The trade-off? The exhaust is incredibly sooty, thick with unburned carbon. Remember that, it's going to matter later. This hot, sooty gas blasts into the turbine at tremendous pressure, spinning it at thousands of RPM. That turbine spins the shaft. That shaft drives the pumps. And those pumps force 2.5 tons of propellant per second into the thrust chamber. The engine feeds itself. It's almost alive. But moving fuel is only half the battle. You also need to keep pressure stable throughout the entire system, from the tanks at the top of the rocket to the engines at the bottom. This is where the heat exchanger comes in. After the exhaust gas leaves the turbine, it passes through a chamber filled with coiled tubes. Liquid oxygen flows through those tubes, absorbing heat from the exhaust. That heated oxygen turns to gas, and that gas gets pumped back up to the top of the LOX tank as a pressurant. The engine cannibalizes itself. It steals liquid oxygen, boils it, and uses the gas to maintain pressure in the tank that's feeding it. It's a closed loop, a self-sustaining system. Now, helium also plays a crucial role here, but not in the way you might think. Helium is used as a pressurant for the RP-1 fuel tank. Because helium is inert, it won't react with anything. But helium had another job, and this one saved the astronauts' lives. Early Saturn V flights suffered from something called the pogo effect. Imagine the rocket as a giant spring. The engines push up, the structure flexes, 
and that flex sends a pressure wave back down through the fuel lines. That wave hits the pumps, changes the fuel flow, which changes the thrust, which makes the rocket flex again. And now you've got a resonant oscillation, a mechanical heartbeat that gets stronger with every cycle. On some early flights, the pogo effect was violent enough that it could have injured or killed the crew. The solution was elegant. Inject helium into the liquid oxygen feed lines, not to pressurize them, but to create compressible pockets. Think of it like the shock absorbers on a car. Those helium bubbles act as cushions, dampening the pressure waves before they can build into destructive oscillation. The helium didn't make the liquid oxygen less dense. It made the system springy where it needed to be and rigid where it didn't. Now the propellants are moving, they're pressurized, they're flowing at thousands of gallons per minute toward the combustion chamber, but they still need to mix. And this is where engineers nearly lost the F1 entirely. The injector plate sits at the top of the thrust chamber, and it's responsible for combining the LOX and RP1 in a way that produces smooth, stable combustion. It's made of a copper alloy. Copper, because of its exceptional thermal conductivity, which helps prevent hot spots that could melt through the plate. The injector contains roughly 2,800 individual orifices, tiny copper tubes that spray fuel and oxidizer into the UBE chamber in precise patterns. Every second, 2.5 metric tons of propellant pass through this intricate copper maze. But early in development, F1 engines were exploding on the test stand, not failing, exploding and for months, no one could figure out why. The problem was combustion instability. When you're burning that much fuel that fast, tiny variations in the mixture can create pressure waves inside the chamber. Those waves reflect off the chamber walls, interfere with each other, and if the frequency is wrong, they amplify. Within milliseconds, you go from controlled burn to catastrophic detonation. The injector plate became the battleground where the F1 was nearly lost. The solution was baffles, raised sections welded onto the face of the injector that divide the combustion chamber into smaller zones. These baffles break up the pressure waves before they can synchronize and amplify. They turn chaos into controlled turbulence. Designing those baffles required hundreds of test firings. Engineers would deliberately destabilize engines with small explosive charges just to study how the combustion recovered or didn't. It was one of the most intensive engineering efforts in the entire Apollo program, and one of the most triumphant. Below the injector plate is the thrust chamber itself, the iconic bell shape that everyone recognizes. But that chamber isn't solid. It's actually hollow. The chamber wall is constructed from hundreds of thin tubes made of a special nickel alloy, chosen for its stability at extreme temperatures. These tubes are brazed together to form the bell shape, with the fuel flowing through the tube walls before it ever reaches the combustion chamber. This is regenerative cooling. The RP-1 fuel absorbs heat from the chamber walls, keeping them from melting, while simultaneously preheating the fuel before it enters the injector. The engine uses its own fuel as coolant, but brazing hundreds of tubes together with zero imperfections? That required building a specialized furnace where the entire thrust chamber assembly could be brazed all at once in a controlled oxygen-free environment at extreme temperatures. This is one of the reasons we can't simply rebuild the F1 today. It's not that we've forgotten how, it's that the specialized industrial infrastructure, the specific furnaces and tooling no longer exists. We'd have to reinvent not just the engine, but the machines that made it. Now remember that mystery I promised to solve? The dark flame at liftoff? Here's the answer. The thrust chamber of the F-1 actually ends at a component called the turbine exhaust manifold, that distinctive ring you see about halfway down the engine. Everything below that is the nozzle extension, and it was added to increase efficiency at higher altitudes. But that extension presented a problem. How do you keep a thin metal cone from melting when it's surrounded by 3,000 degree exhaust gas? You can't use regenerative cooling. Down there, the fuel has already entered the chamber. So instead, Rocketdyne engineers use the leftover exhaust from the gas generator. Remember that sooty, fuel-rich exhaust from earlier? 
After it's done spinning the turbine and passing through the heat exchanger, it still has heat energy and pressure. That exhaust is routed through the turbine exhaust manifold and forced through thousands of tiny apertures between overlapping steel shingles that line the inside of the nozzle extension. This creates a film of cooler gas between the white-hot main exhaust and the metal walls. It's called film cooling, and it's the only thing keeping that extension from vaporizing. And that dark column of flame you see at liftoff? That's the unburned carbon from the gas generator exhaust, billowing out around the edge of the main flame. As it rises and mixes with the primary exhaust, it finally combusts, which is why the dark column transitions into blinding white just a few feet below the engine. The F1's signature look isn't a design choice. It's a byproduct of survival. Now we understand how the engine works, but how do you start it? Starting the F1 is less like turning a key and more like waking a sleeping dragon without getting eaten. You cannot simply light a spark in a stream of 2.5 tons of fuel per second. The resulting explosion would shatter the engine instantly. Instead, the F1 performs a carefully choreographed mechanical ballet. And almost everything is controlled not by electronics, but by fluid dynamics. There are remarkably few moving parts. The system was designed that way intentionally, because at these pressures and temperatures, mechanical complexity means mechanical failure. First, the turbine has to spin up. As pressure builds in the fuel lines, it reaches a threshold that ruptures small capsules containing hypergolic fluid, chemicals that ignite spontaneously on contact with oxygen. This hypergol mixes with the fuel and enters the chamber, creating a pilot flame. But here's the genius. If the main fuel flow hit that flame at full pressure, the sudden combustion would generate enough force to wrench the engine from its mounts or collapse the rocket's structure. So, the thrust chamber is pre-filled with ethylene glycol, antifreeze. This dilutes the initial surge of fuel, forcing the engine to cough to life rather than detonate. It transforms a catastrophic bang into the signature rising whoosh that signals the beast is awake. But even a controlled startup isn't enough because now you have five F1 engines screaming at full power, generating a combined 34 million newtons of thrust, and the astronauts are sitting on top of all that fury. If you just let the rocket go, the G-forces would be brutal. The acceleration would spike, potentially injuring the crew or damaging the vehicle. So NASA had one last trick. They held it back. At the base of the launch platform, massive hold-down arms gripped the rocket frame. Even after, the engines reached full thrust. Even after the command was given to release, the Saturn V couldn't leave. Because those arms were connected to tapered steel bolts that passed through matching tapered dies mounted on the rocket's first stage. The fit was tight, enormously tight. For a heartbeat, maybe two, the full fury of five F-1 engines pulled against those bolts, slowly stretching them, slowly dragging them through the tapered dies. The metal screamed under tension. The entire launch platform vibrated. And then finally, the bolts pulled free, and 3,000 tons of rocket rose into the sky with an almost gentle grace. That soft release wasn't a flaw in the system. It was the system, one last act of control over an uncontrollable force. The Saturn V first stage burned for only about two and a half minutes. In that brief window, it pushed the entire rocket, all 3,000 tons of it, to over 60 kilometers in altitude and nearly 100 kilometers downrange. And as the rocket climbed out of the thick lower atmosphere into the thinner air above, something remarkable happened. The F-1 engines became more efficient. With less atmospheric pressure fighting against the exhaust, thrust increased by nearly 20%. But the fuel was running out, and shutting down presented its own challenges. You couldn't just turn the engines off. If the propellant mixture went too rich or too lean during shutdown, if one engine cut out before the others, the asymmetric thrust could send the rocket tumbling. And you absolutely could not let the tanks run dry through the engines. The unpredictable mixture could cause anything from a flameout to a detonation. So shutdown was as choreographed as startup. All five engines reduced thrust in precise coordination, then cut off completely, all before stage separation. When the first stage finally released, 
you've probably seen what happens in the telescope footage. A massive plume of gas erupts between the stages. Those aren't the main engines. Those are retro rockets. Mounted in the four fairings around the outer F1 engines, those rounded cowlings with the fins, small cover plates blow free and solid fuel retro rockets ignite, firing backward. Their job is to yank the spent first stage away from the accelerating second stage as quickly as possible, preventing any chance of collision. That violent separation plume is the final act of the SIC stage, one last controlled explosion before it falls back to the Atlantic. I've simplified some things here, and I've left out countless details. The metallurgy alone could fill a textbook. The startup sequence has dozens of steps I didn't mention. The injector plate development consumed years and hundreds of millions of dollars. But here's what I want you to take away. We built a machine with the power of an atomic bomb's worth of energy released over 150 seconds. We controlled it with fluid dynamics, thermal physics, and mechanical ingenuity. We tamed chaos not with computers, but with copper tubes and brazed nickel alloy and helium bubbles, and we rode it to the moon. We can't build the F-1 today. Not easily, anyway. Not because we've forgotten how, but because the industrial infrastructure that forged these giants no longer exists. The specialized furnaces, the tooling, the institutional knowledge of thousands of engineers who spent careers perfecting each component. But we're still learning from it. Modern engine designers study the F-1's solutions to combustion instability. SpaceX engineers have examined recovered F-1 engines from the ocean floor. The lessons of that era echo in every rocket that flies today. The F-1 wasn't just an engine. It was proof that humans could imagine something audacious, build something impossible, and bend the laws of physics just enough to slip the bonds of Earth. I hope you found this interesting. I'll be back again with something over at the bench real soon. Thanks a lot.